So I work for a think tank. My job is to travel the country. Um, I work with councils, with local public services. I try and help them think of better ways to run their services, ways to revitalize local democracy. So I guess you could say that I'm in the business of ideas. And there's a kind of idea which I think is particularly interesting. It's the sort of idea which is so simple, so compelling, so obvious that we just accept it. It's just the way the world is. It becomes part of the air we breathe. And we stop questioning those ideas. We stop testing them. And sometimes that's a mistake, because sometimes those ideas are wrong, and they're holding us back. I want to talk today about one of those ideas that I think is wrong, and that I think is holding the country back. It's the idea of political centralism. Essentially, it's the idea that the best way to run a society is to take as much money, as much power, as much authority as you can, and put it all in one place. In our case, that's London, Whitehall, Westminster, the city. And once we put that power in that place, we're going to get a bunch of politicians and a bunch of experts, and they're going to make the decisions. They're going to decide what our city should look like, what our town should look like, how our economy will work, how public services will work. We're going to give them the power. Now, what I want you to do over the next 10 minutes is come with me on a journey in which we'll reject this ridiculous 20th century notion that a bunch of people in London, those experts, have all the answers, and we don't. I want you to reject that. We're going to go to a much wilder, more interesting place, a much more decentralized place, where we're going to put faith in the wisdom of crowds and the people in this room. We're going to take power back to our towns, to our cities, to our communities. And if you go on that journey with me, I can promise you that we will find more vibrant, more prosperous British cities as a result. I can promise you a shot at saving our public services from the ravages of austerity. And you know what? It's going to be a lot of fun, and you'll be happier for coming on this journey. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, awesome. So <laughs> we don't think a lot about, uh, I really hope they can edit that out of the video. Um, <laughs> we don't think a lot about political centralism in this country. Why would we? We've all got other things to worry about. But we should probably think about it a bit more. Because over the last 30 years, we've slowly sleepwalked into becoming the most centralized country in the developed world. Now, that seems really weird. We're tough Anglo-Saxons. We don't want people telling us what to do. We don't want big government breathing down our necks all the time. We're free marketeers. We're liberals. We're rugged individualists. And yet, paradoxically, we put more faith in people like David Cameron and Tony Blair to run our affairs than does anyone else in the rich world. We put more faith in our prime minister and the cabinet than does Australia, Denmark, Germany, America. We put huge, huge faith in these people. We've all heard the politics of centralism. You've all heard it. A politician stands up, a Margaret Thatcher, a Tony Blair, and their message is simple. Don't trust the people close to you. Don't trust the people in your church, your synagogue, your temple. Those people are well-meaning, but they don't really know how to make society better. They're just do-gooders. Don't trust the public servants who run your councils or your hospitals. Because those people, they look like they care about you, but really, they're in it for themselves. And the trade unions are even worse. Don't trust the voluntary sector, bunch of vested interests, more do-gooders. And certainly, above all, don't trust councillors. Do not trust those councillors you elected. At best, they're incompetent. At worst, they're corrupt. Don't trust any of those people. Trust me, Margaret. Trust me, Tony. Give me your vote. Give me the power. Sit back and watch as I deliver you a better future. Now, that's superficially really compelling. We just give someone our vote, we give them the power, and they'll do it all for us. Amazing. Why am I even here telling you to reject it? Because you're intelligent people, and if you spend more than a few seconds thinking about that idea of giving them all the power and sitting back, you'll realize it can't possibly work. And it doesn't work. What centrism promises us is two things. It promises us prosperity, and it promises us fairness. So let's deal with prosperity. National economic policy tells us that our economy will boom, we'll all be richer. Well, that works if you're in London, where the policy set, its economy's roared ahead over the last 15 years. But if you're in Birmingham, Leeds, if you're in Manchester, your economy's been falling behind. And a big part of the reason for that is that the people that you elect to run your city can't take decisions about your economy. They don't have the power, because it's all in London. They don't really control the amount of tax you pay, they don't control the schools, they don't have much say in healthcare, skills, transport, in most of the areas that drive your economy, they're not really in control. 
So it's not surprising that our regional cities are falling behind. They're not in command of their economic destiny. Would devolution make any difference? Would giving more power back to cities make any difference? Absolutely, it would. What the data tells us is that devolving power and money is correlated with high levels of growth, high levels of productivity. One study recently estimated that if we returned those powers cities have lost to places like Birmingham, we could unleash up to 80 billion pounds of extra GDP by 2030. So centralism hasn't been great for growth. What about equality? That's a more powerful claim, isn't it? Centralism, those wise people in Whitehall, they're going to redistribute the money, make sure the public services are the same everywhere, make us a fairer society. Except they haven't. We've become more and more centralized over the last 30 years and less and less equal. We're now one of the least equal countries in Western Europe. If centralism is making us more equal, it's doing a pretty lousy job of it. Now, if you're about my age, or slightly younger, slightly older, then you'd have come of age about the time of the internet. I first came across the internet when I went to university. I grew up with it. The internet has given me more freedom, more power, more control over my life than I've ever had before. I can download practically every word mankind's ever written on my smartphone now in this room. I can download all the music that's ever been recorded. If I really want to, I can spend a couple of thousand pounds on a 3D printer, download a schematic, and print out a gun at home and go and rob a bank. I don't recommend it, but I could. In my private life, I've got unprecedented power and opportunity. But in the public realm, when I step into politics, nothing seems to have changed. All I hear is no. Can we have more affordable housing in that development so my kids can buy a house? No, it's been decided somewhere else. Can I have more say in the shape of my local economy? No, it's been decided somewhere else. Can I keep that library open? Can I keep that school open? No, someone else has decided. Everywhere we turn, someone else has decided. I think one of the key goals for our generation is to tear down the division between the creativity of our private and economic lives and the stultification of the public realm, to tear down that barrier and bring the energy of makerspaces, of co-working, of startups into the world of government, into the world of politics. The good news is that I think that process in a small way has started. The current government, for all of its faults, has recognized it doesn't have all the answers. Next year, those of you who live in the West Midlands, Coventry, Birmingham, the black country, you're going to vote for a mayor for that region. And that's going to bring some of those economic powers back down to the city. That's a really important first step, but it's only a first step. And it's a very small first step on what I think is a much bigger journey. You all know that we live in an age of austerity. You all know what that's doing to public services and communities around the country. Austerity is bad news. I see it all the time in councils. But austerity is also forcing us to confront some really difficult truths. And the most difficult truth of all is that the public services we've inherited from the 21st century are no longer fit for purpose. They need gigantic reform. Take the welfare system. At the moment, the answer to welfare reform every time seems to be create, to create a welfare system that's cheaper, that's meaner, that punishes people for being out of work. Maybe that was fine 40 years ago when people had jobs for life, but we don't anymore. More and more of us work in precarious jobs. More and more of us are moving into the gig economy and becoming self-employed. Yet our welfare system punishes us for short-term periods of unemployment which are becoming normal. It has to change. Look at healthcare. We spend something like 96% of the NHS budget on treating people who are already sick and only 4% on keeping people healthy. That might have worked 50 years ago when most people died in their 70s, but now we live into our 80s, into our 90s, often with chronic conditions. We need a health service that keeps us well. We need to take that money and use it to keep people well. Because in the 21st century, we need an independent service and a wellness service, not the sickness service we've inherited. The smartest public services I work with recognize they don't have the answers anymore. They've become as efficient as they can. They've changed their services. They've revitalized their back offices. There's not a lot more they can do. They need to open up and invite in entrepreneurs social enterprises, co-ops, communities, to hack the state, to hack the city, to transform public services for the 21st century. And the good news is, there's a global movement of people who are starting to do that kind of hacking. My favorite example comes from New York in 2012, when Superstorm Sandy hits the city. This wall of rain, this wall of wind, which isolates Manhattan, which floods the tunnels, cuts off the bridges, which leaves the city's infrastructure in a mess. The Federal Emergency Management Agency shuts its doors because it's too windy. The Occupy movement, who you all asked to remember being pepper sprayed in Zuccotti Park, drive out to Brooklyn, 
and they set up in a church. And using Facebook and Amazon, they start to build a DIY disaster relief operation. When they start out, they're hoping to mobilize maybe 40 volunteers, maybe a few hundred dollars of donations. By the time they finished, they'd mobilized 600,000 people and hundreds of thousands of dollars of donations. How do I know about this story? Because it was so important, the Department of Homeland Security did a case study of it. And they're now trying to work out how to get anarchist disaster relief operations based on mutual aid to work alongside the Department of Homeland Security, which is sort of creepy, actually. <laughs> there are examples of this stuff all over the place. You'll see them in Birmingham. My friend Anne-Marie Naylor decided that she thought libraries were an outdated institution. She thought going into a place where all you did was read things other people had written was a very 20th century idea. So she decided to create a DIY library called The Waiting Room in Colchester. And the idea was to create a library where you went to create and contribute. This was a room which was funded by a clever regeneration scheme. She hired out two kiosks on the front to make money. And in this space, she brought in tools, components. She built a community. She brought all these people together to make things. The signature event for the waiting room was Maker Wednesdays. And people would come together, and they'd learn how to make electronic gadgets and widgets, usually using things like Raspberry Pis. And the only rule was, if you made something, you left it there. And you contributed to the Knowledge Commons. And anyone could use it. Anyone could buy it. These boxes, these maker boxes that she put together, now travel up and down the country, transforming the library service. The world is full of these incredible examples of huge people-powered change. And I think they're starting to snowball. Don't tell me this can't be transformational. The number of cooperatives has risen by 25% over the last couple of years. The number of community businesses rose by 10% last year alone. A small estate is a pretty difficult proposition for a lot of us. But it's a lot easier if there's also a smaller private sector. And what we do is build the civic commons in the middle, that realm of civic activity that can come in and hack the state, can make our public services better, can take power back. There is a revolution coming. And the great thing about this revolution is that you're all of its leaders. The revolution will not be centralized. Thank you.